Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Trinity Long Room Hub online. I'm Eve Patton. I'm director of the Hub. And for those of you who don't know us or who are joining us for the first time, the Trinity Long Room Hub is the Arts and Humanities Research Institute in Trinity. As you will know, uh, this year marks 50 years of uh, Ireland's EU membership. And today, we're very pleased to be hosting what is the first of a two-part seminar series, which we've organized uh, as part of the Department of Foreign Affairs Commemorating Europe Initiative for 2022. Um, our title is Visions of Europe in Irish Cultural Debate. And we're starting today with some retrospectives. What did the idea of being European mean for the Ireland of the last century? And particularly in those often overlooked middle decades of the 20th century, when uh, despite the poet Patrick Kavanagh's depiction of an Ireland, quote, that froze for want of Europe, um, there were many fertile connections to the continent, intellectual connections, cultural connections, connections forged through art, through languages, uh, through publishing. How did these relationships and the various debates that emerged around them inform our longer term association with Europe and how do they contextualize Ireland's accession to the EU and what came afterwards? Well, these are big questions. This is a large topic, but we have exactly the right panel with us today to, uh, to tackle this subject. I'm going to introduce our speakers very briefly because you have the full information on them uh, on our website. Uh, I'm really pleased to welcome, first of all, Richard Carney. Richard uh, holds the Charles B. Seelig Chair of Philosophy at Boston College, and he's well known as one of Ireland's most prominent philosophers and public intellectuals, author of many influential books. Richard, I never see um, a bibliography for Irish studies that doesn't still have the Irish mind from 1985 listed on it. Uh, he was also editor of the pioneering journal, The Crane Bag, between 1977 and 1985. Um, Richard is going to speak first for about 25 minutes, and then we're going to move to the rest of our guests for some comments and responses. Um, so I now want to welcome Michael Cronin, uh, who is the 1776 Professor of French in Trinity, the author again of many books, including most recently Eco Travel, Journeying in the Age of the Anthropocene from Cambridge 2022. Um, and Michael is an expert, of course, not only in French, but in the many languages, including Irish, that form a European cultural ecosystem. Um, he was also the former co-founder and editor of the Irish journal Graph, which of course looked very much to Europe for some of its grounding ideas. Uh, so I hope we'll hear more about that. Uh, our second respondent, Edith Sigarak, was uh, is Emeritus Professor of German uh, at Trinity. Uh, she was also the university's first female registrar and a long list of many other firsts. Ida is a historian of modern Germany and also of the early history of the Irish Free State. And she recently published her memoir, Living With My Century. This was published by Lilliput Press in 2022. Uh, and when I read it, I was struck by how much her story tells through the lens of an individual life, something about the many connections that existed between Ireland, uh, Britain, and Europe as they each navigated the second half of the 20th century in particular. So Ida, I'm absolutely delighted that you can join us today. And then last but not least, Aidan O'Malley uh, is very welcome. Aidan is the co-organizer co of this seminar series. He's also the chair of English Literary Studies at the University of Rijeka in Croatia. Aidan is widely published in translation and intercultural studies, uh, and he's in particular an expert on the work of the Field Day Theatre Enterprise in European translation. Uh, and I hope to, to hear more from him um, later on today about the view from Europe's Eastern Wing, where he's currently in residence. So our three respondents are going to have about 10 minutes each uh, after Richard has talked. 
And then what I'd like to do is open to the audience uh, for the half hour that we should have left for questions, comments, and, and uh, a little bit of discussion. So if you have a question or a comment, please use the Q&A box, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen, um, and put your, your question as briefly as possible in there. And we'll try to get to as many of those as we can um, at the end of the afternoon before wrapping up at five o'clock. So with that housekeeping out of the way, I'm absolutely delighted that we're getting this opportunity to talk about visions of Europe. And uh, let me now ask Richard Carney if he'd like to talk to us uh, first. Richard. Thank you, Eve, and thank you um, all for, for organizing this. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. And I will keep it as, um, let me just see, unmute myself. There we go. Um, I will keep it as conversational as possible. Uh, Aidan, when he first wrote to me about, about this um, conversation, suggested that I might begin with the crane bag and uh, be perhaps a little autobiographical about that, um, and then move, move from there to, to this question about Ireland's role in Europe, past, present and future. So let me begin then with... Um, the notion uh, of the fifth province, uh, which we cited uh, when we published the first issue of the uh, crane bag in 1977. And the fifth province uh, is an, an ancient mythological idea um, that comes from the fact that the term in Irish for, for fifth, uh, uh, is the same as for a province. And yet there are four geographical literal provinces on the island of Ireland, as, as you all know, Munster, Leinster, Connacht, and um, uh, what am I missing? <laughs> Leinster, Munster, Leinster, Connacht, and Ulster. But uh, this, they're called fifths. So, you know, four fifths, and where's the fifth? So the, the idea was that it's an imaginary community. It's an imaginary idea. And that without it, the other four cannot live in peace. So, uh, th this was something that Pontius McConnell, who's a great Irish uh, Celtic scholar, many of you may remember him, um, related to an Indo-European culture and always saw Ireland and Irish, the language, the culture, uh, in what he called an Indo-European, more global, more European context. Um, so as to avoid uh, Gaelic and Celtic studies, which was his particular domain, he was a wonderful Irish scholar, um, thinking into sort of a, a narrow nationalism and heeding, you know, Heaney's word that the local goes beyond the locale. So this idea of the fifth province that could uh, unite the other four, particularly at a time of war, because 1977, you know, things were still very hot in Northern Ireland, not far from Dublin, where we were publishing the journal and where I was teaching at the time. Um, but I'd like to begin perhaps, and this I hope will be my only quote um, uh, in my efforts to keep this conversation, but I'll, I'll just perhaps cite a paragraph from that initial 1977 preface to the crane bag on the fifth province. It goes as follows. Modern Ireland is made up of four provinces whose origin lies beyond the beginning of recorded history. And yet the Irish word for province is quicked or quicked, which means a fifth. This fivefold division is as old as Ireland itself, yet there is disagreement about the identity of the fifth fifth. Some claim that all the provinces of Ireland, uh, sorry, some claim that all the provinces met at the stone of divisions on the hill of Ishnoch, believed to be the midpoint of Ireland. Others say that the fifth province was Meath, Midja, or the middle. Both traditions divide Ireland into four quarters and a middle, though they disagree about the location of this middle or fifth province. Although Tara was always the political center of Ireland, this middle or fifth province acted as a second center, which although non-political was just as important, acting as a necessary balance. It was sometimes described as a secret well, known only to the Druids and Philae. Those two centers acted like two kidneys in the body of the land. The balance between the two was guarantor of peace and harmony in the country as a whole. So with that in mind, this idea of the fifth province. Um, uh, we tried in, in the crane bag to talk about the local, um, but also what goes beyond the locale. And uh, therefore, to engage uh, with European uh, thinkers and writers, 
and poets as much as with uh, indigenous Irish authors. Um, so there was this dual sort of fidelity, if you will, to the immediate problem and indeed crisis and the emergency of war going on on the north of our island because some people were clinging to a notion of a united Ireland, others to the other community, the unions community, to a notion of the United Kingdom, the two into one don't go. So there had to be give somewhere. And eventually, um, the, the idea of the fifth province was that you could be both hand. Uh, and, and, and this was developed, we tried to develop it in the, in, in the crane bag over whatever eight years, and then Field Day took it up in their way. Of course, Seamus Heaney was was very influential in, in helping us set up a crane bag and, of course, played a key role in, 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 uh, in Field Day. And Aidan will have more to say about this. Um, so there was that sense of how do we respond to what's going on on this island at the time, which was, which was war and violence and bloodshed and division um, between nationalists and unionists, and also look uh, outside of Ireland to, uh, to a consideration of Ireland and Britain as islands within a council of islands and within the European context. So in one of the early issues, I did an interview with my mentor at the time in Paris, Paul Ricoeur, I was doing a doctorate with him, and uh, he had written a lot on, as some of you may know, on myth and metaphor and symbol. This was his key area, the hermeneutics of imagination. And uh, we had a discussion on the role of myth and I started with the, with the myth of the fifth province. And his point was that myth is not something ancient, but something that is still alive today as a bearer of possible worlds. That memories of mythic events are not just about what happened or might have happened in the past, it was said to happen in the past, fado, fado. So whether it's mythic um, story or whether it's history, uh, our memory of the past always carries an element of, of, of potential, of something that hasn't happened, that was an aspiration, that was an expectation, that was an imagination, that was, if you will, in the Irish country, a fifth province. You had the four, but there was always the fifth that opened up the future. So myth is the bearer of possible worlds was the actual title of our dialogue. Where you point out, you know, language can be uh, descriptive. You know, this is a door. It can be functional, open the door, uh, or it can be mythic poetic. Mythopoetic was the term uh, he used, uh, meaning, take an example, you know, the door into the dark is the key to the kingdom. Um, but of course, um, the door is not a key. It is a key, it's like a key, but it's not a key. So the is and the is not of metaphor or indeed of mythic language opens up a double relationship to what is and what might be. So this was the domain of the fifth province that we were trying to kind of tease out in relation to um, a reconsideration of Ireland in its Irishness and its Irish Britishness and its Irish Europeanness but to extend the circle uh, of the fifth province. Um, and throughout the, 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 the years of, of Crane Bag, we conducted different conversations with a number of different European thinkers. Uh, Herbert Marcuse, the, the German Jewish thinker who was exiled from Nazi Germany and who had a very strong um, philosophy, again, of imagination. Um, Paul Ricoeur himself, Chris Deva, Levinas, Derrida, Girard, these were some of the thinkers who were involved in the crane bag debate, Frank Daras, um, and uh, we had a, a conference in Le Collège Irlandais in Paris in 1981, uh, where we engaged in debate with a series of Irish philosophers and of uh, European philosophers. And um, introducing that particular conference, I invoked John Scotus Arugina as um, an Irish philosopher who in the ninth century had gone to Paris to translate the works of um, the pseudo Dennis uh, from Greek into Latin. He was one of the few scholars at the time who had Latin and Greek. And Charles the Bald, nephew of, 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 of Charlemagne, so it was a Carolingian Francia at the time, invited uh, Arugina and a band of fellow uh, Irish monks, um, uh, um, Fergus of Leon, um, Sedulius Scotus and others, um, Johannes Hibernensis, to uh, actually come and work in Paris and in Leon uh, 
uh, and translate these works and develop a, a philosophy basically for uh, Carolingian in Europe. And it was, it was interesting because the house where they lived was called the house of Hilaritas, Hilaritas in Latin, because they were always laughing. And um, it's actually Ezra Pound who points this out in, in his commentary on, on Arugina. But one of the, one of the dialogues in, in, in Cranebag that came to mind as I was thinking about what I'd say today was that of uh, Borges. Um, when he came to Dublin in 1981, I think it was, for the Joy Centenary, and it was in 81, 82, actually. And uh, we had a, a trialogue, myself, Borges and Heaney, where he, Borges, said the following about what he considered to be an Irish mind that connected different Irish thinkers that he had read as sort of a European, Latin American intellectual, cosmopolitan intellectual. And this is what he had to say. I, I, I promised one quote, but here's a second one. As an outsider looking on successive Irish thinkers, I've been struck by unusual and remarkable repetitions. Berkeley was the first Irish philosopher I read, followed by Wilde, Shaw and Joyce. And finally, there was John Scotus Rugina. I loved reading his De Divisione Nature, which taught that God creates himself through the creation of his creatures in nature. Sort of a theopoetics. I discovered that Berkeley's doctrine of the creative powers of the mind was already anticipated by Rugina's metaphysics of creation, that the, and that this in turn recurred in several other Irish writers whose thinking is remarkable remarkably akin to a regional system of things coming from the mind of God and returning to him. I love the idea that all genuine creation stems from a metaphysical nothingness, what a Rugina called the nihil of God, which resides at the heart of our existence. So we went on then to discuss a Rugina and came back to the, to the relationship between Joyce and a Rugina. After all, this was Joyce's centenary. That's why he was in Dublin. And that was the topic of our conversation. And we recalled indeed that um, when Joyce gave his series of lectures in Trieste, where I know Aidan spent some time, um, his Trieste lectures on Ireland, saints and scholars, um, began with Arugina. Arugina played a, a key role for him in that. And he had that famous phrase that I'm sure many of you know, that his work, like Rugina's, was to hibernicize Europe and Europeanize Ireland. And it was that sort of a, a, a Rugian um, message of, of communication and conversation and translation between European and Irish cultures embodied by Rugina that Joyce in his writing was actually performing and achieving. Um, so one of the, signal features of the of the fifth province um, as embodied by uh, Arugina and that particular period of early Irish culture. I don't want to spend too long on this because we're looking towards Europe, but this is one of the foundations indeed of, of modern Europe, was the idea of the circumnavigatio, that to be an intellectual, to be a scholar, to be a holy person, um, one had a calling to circumnavigatio or peregrinatio, as it was also called in Latin, which was a journey. Now, sometimes it was a little journey, as in, you know, the legend of St. Brendan, you got on a, in a coracle or a curragh or a boat, a yawl, and off you went. And maybe you reached uh, some blessed isles, or maybe you didn't. It founded the famous Ivra, Ivramf, Imrav um, tradition of, of the journey out and around that Paul Muldoon, for example, celebrated in, in some of his... Uh, poetry in the 1980s um, on the Maildun, the Imrav Maildun. But um, whether it was literal, and we never know with Brendan whether it was literal or mythic imaginary anyway, or whether it was a mental journey, the idea was that you went out from where you were and you discovered the world in order to return to where you started from. And if white navigatio was when you went out and you never returned. A green navigatio was one when you went out and you did return and you did find land. But the, the important point was you couldn't remain, remain loyal to the local if you didn't go beyond the locale, coming back to Heaney's phrase again. So that it was this both and you are loyal to your Irishness by also traversing what is not Irish, what is other, what is strange. And this was a basic be a culture of linguistic hospitality and of philosophical hospitality to, to otherness, to strangeness, to what is out there, 
And it was very linked with the maritime. And, you know, if you read Arugina, the, the metaphors are very maritime. We must set sail into uncharted waters and so on. But there was this idea of an adventure um, and that to be Irish was to be Irish and cosmopolitan, as it were, at the same time. Mundana sum. I've forgotten who said that. Maybe it was Arugina. But anyway, it was, um, it was very much central to, to this thinking. So, um, so much for Borges and Joyce and Arugina. Um, and indeed Heaney, uh, with his two buckets were easier carried than one I grew up in between. But that sense of a double belonging and a double fidelity to what's Irish and, and non-Irish. And, you know, Heaney's exchanges and in Montague's exchanges with John Hewitt in, the, in this were very important, you know, writing about each, each other's cultures, the Unionist, the Nationalist, the British, the Irish. And I think that particular body of writing, which also included very much um, uh, Field Day and its uh, taking up of the Fifth Province idea, was, I think, uh, quite, quite important uh, in, in preparing the ground for the Good Friday Agreement in 1998, where, as we read in the famous paragraph, uh, citizens of Northern Ireland could be British or Irish or both. So that sense of British Irishness within a European context was 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 extremely important. And another figure in this regard in the Craneback debate, but also in the Irish mind debate, where again, Rujan featured very importantly, but all, and Berkeley and Shaw and Swift and many of the people that Borges mentioned in that in that 1982 interview. But it was opening up to up to the European. Um, and uh, a key figure in that, that I wanted to come back to is John Hume. Um, and John, uh, so much to say about John, I'll be, I'll be short because I think I've got, not, I don't want to go beyond my time, and, you know, so, so 10 minutes more max. But John was very committed at the time in the late, in, in the 80s really, when, the crane bag was 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 at its kind of I don't know most most intense um, um, uh, mode of existence. <laughs> it lasted for about eight hours, and then that was eight day eight, eight years, and then and then it was time to pass on. But John was thinking at the time very much also of this British Irish connection in terms of a council of Isles, in terms of Ireland as a as a region within Europe. And I worked with him on a number of proposals, including the proposal for um, at the New Ireland Forum in 1985, sorry, 1983, December 8th, 1983, for a, um, a joint sovereignty. And John was very much behind the thinking. I mean, I, I was perhaps a spokesperson for the idea, and I was very interested in the idea, obviously. Uh, and I, I, I presented it with Bernard Cullen. Uh, who was representing, he was a unionist philosopher from Queen's University of Belfast, I was UCD at the time. Anyway, we co-presented it as this idea of joint sovereignty within a European context uh, of um, regions, Federal, federalism and regionalism, with the nation between. The idea being that the nation state was both small and too large, um, too small, to recognize our international transnational connections with Britain and with our European um, confreres um, and too big to fully appreciate the importance of decentralized uh, local government. And this was very important in the European context, of course, where you had many regions that were were, were very ignored by, by the centralized state, France, Spain, Italy, Germany, but the lender in Italy, the regiones, and then the les Regions, they, there was a big movement at the time. And John was one of the people spearheading this um, towards a revival of lesser, lo lesser known languages, as it was called, and Irish was part of that, uh, of those many languages, Basque and, and Provençal and so on, uh, Catalan. And um, uh, the regions within Europe were moving for a greater sense of political representation and participatory democracy in sometimes historically centralized nation states where sovereignty ruled supreme and sovereignty is based on the principle of Baudin and Rousseau, uh, 
la souveraineté est une et indivisible. It's one and indivisible. So what do you do with all the people who are different within the nation, who are not une et indivisible? Not to mention then, obviously, relations across, across frontiers and borders. So the movement of, of, of a European federalism and regionalism at one at the same time. Because if you go too much towards regionalism, you fall back into micro-nationalisms. And then you'd have sort of in the Irish context, that would be Munster has its own kingdom and Leinster and Ulster in, in independent regions. So that's not the answer. That's back to kind of an old tribalism um, and separatism. Um, <clears throat> and uh, denying one's national identity stroke identities altogether in the name of some pan-European Esperanto sort of federalism is not going to work either. So there was that attempt around um, around Cranebag, I think Field Day, um, uh, the Irish Mind mentioned earlier by Eve, um, then a, a, a book I edited called Across the Frontiers, Ireland in the 1990s, which again brought together sort of 10 European philosophers, thinkers, writers, and 10 Irish, uh, thinking about how do we work towards this idea of um, a, a Council of Isles, a British Irish Council of Isles within a European context. So that was the thinking for that. And it was, it sort of ran from the Forum for a New Ireland, the Joint Sovereignty Proposal in, in 1983. And that was basically how do we move beyond sovereignty in, in the exclusive sense of, sense of sovereignty towards a post-sovereignty, a post-nationalist and a post-unionist Ireland within a post-nationalist and a post-unionist Britain. And then extending obviously into, into Europe. Brexit has complicated that, but maybe in the discussion we can get back to it because in a way uh, it's raised again the importance of developing perhaps a council of isles. Um, which could reintegrate uh, Ireland and Britain in, in a new kind of relationship where we obviously remain part of Britain and they, for the moment, do not but decentralize into regions, uh, which might have interesting implications, obviously, for the Northern Irish Brexit logjam and the protocol. And then there was the, um, the OPSAL Commission uh, contribution um, in Belfast, 2nd of February, 19. Uh, 93, Northern Ireland's future as a European region, and then 1995, Forum for Peace and Reconciliation in Dublin Castle. That was a return to Dublin Castle. And in, in all of those proposals, um, I was working with somebody from, from the unionist tradition. I was hailing from a nationalist Republican tradition. So Bernard Cullen in the first instance, 1983, the Forum for New Ireland, and then Robin Wilson, um, uh, in the second instance. But I just note that for, for the record, they, they were published in Post-Nationalist Ireland. So I'd just like to end, um, because I've gone for 20 minutes and I would like to come in under time to allow more time for discussion. But I'd like to end with perhaps, um, well, I have two things I was going to end on. One was um, something more on Heaney and Hewitt, but I think I'll leave that for now. Um, and just confine my remaining few remarks to Paul Ricoeur, I know that Aidan's going to be talking about this, so this is just kind of a segue to Aidan, a, a, a signposting of, of, of what Aidan may be saying in, in future conversation. But one thing that I learned very much from Paul Ricoeur uh, in our crane bag exchanges and working with him was the notion of linguistic hospitality and translation, the translation model. Um, and uh, I know this is very, very close to Michael's wonderful work on translation. Um, so I'll just signal one or two ideas here. The idea of narrative exchange uh, between the different cultures and nations of Europe. Um, you know, l'Europe sera culturelle ou elle ne sera pas, as Monet said. And uh, Ricard took that very seriously, as, as did I. Um, and uh, the notion of narr narrative exchange of memories and identities between the different peoples of Europe was kind of crucial in this regard. Ricard wrote an essay in the 1980s called Towards a New Ethos for Europe. And he calls for linguistic hospitality there, which is um, um, trans-confessional, transnational, and transcultural. And he said, it's only by exchanging our wounds with each other and our desires that we can actually become each other and um, work beyond our wounds. But amnesia, uh, sorry, amnesty, uh, 
It cannot be based on amnesia. We need to remember the hurts and the scars and the wounds and then exchange them in a way that enables us to retrieve potential memory, right? From actual wounds and sufferings and victimizations uh, to, to potential memory um, as a bearer of possible, as a bearer of possible worlds. Uh, so again, um, I tried to work some of these ideas out in, in a, a recent book called Radical Hospitality from Thought to Action, where I develop Ricoeur's notion of linguistic hospitality as translation and narrative exchange and exchange of memories and exchange of identities to uh, contemporary questions of what is happening in the Irish-British context and in the, in the European context. Um, and in a uh, guest book, which I co-direct with Sheila Gallagher, a, a, a guest book, um, sorry, a, a fellow um, Boston College colleague and artist here in, here in Boston, uh, in the guest book project, we have tried to implement that notion of narrative hospitality. It's, it, the motto is from, from uh, hostility to hospitality, given the fact that hostis and hospe is the roots of these words in in, in Latin, but in all Indo-European languages have this double sense of friend and enemy. So how do you turn an initial hostility into the enemy? How do you use your hand not to grab for the sword, but to but to um, extend an open palm in friendship? As um, I'm trying to remember her name, and I'll come back to me in a moment, said, uh, you know, the handshake is the, is the, uh, is the first act of civilization and uh, how, how right she, she, she was. I think maybe it was Julia Chris Dave in one of our dialogues. But um, in, in guest book, then, we're trying to uh, apply this philosophy of narrative hospitality, moving from hostility to hospitality, um, to a number of communities in Ireland, in Europe, and indeed further afield. Uh, but Croatia and, and Derry, we've, we've worked quite closely um, with the European Centre for War and Peace in Croatia and the nerve center in, in, in Derry um, to, to, uh, to, to produce a, a series of digital dialogues called exchanging stories between young people from the divided communities. Um, and if I had time, I would love to have shown you clips from those, some of those. They're very moving and very telling. Um, but I'll just end with, um, with an image that was very important for, 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 for both guest book and for Craneback, and that is um, the old story of um, Garold Moore Fitzgerald, who was um, besieging uh, Lord Butler in Dublin Castle, I think it was in the 14th century, and you know, it was one of these endless cycles of, of revenge and, and, and bloodshed. And at one point he said, look, we should end this. Uh, I'm going to take off my armor, extend my naked arm and hand through the hole in the door. You, you, you make a hole in the door. I'll extend my arm so you can cut it off and we'll continue the war. Or you can shake my hand and we make peace. And uh, he did so. And uh, Lord Butler, uh, Ormond, I think, Ormond Butler, uh, shook his hand rather than cutting it off, and they made peace, at least for a time. And from that comes the phrase, um, to chance your arm, as some of you may, may know. And I think that's what we need to do in the Irish European, Irish British European context now is to, is to chance our arm again. And there's always a risk in linguistic hospitality because you can extend your hand and it can be cut off. I mean, hostility is always there in the shadows. And to ignore that is sort of some ironic form of optimism that actually does nobody uh, any good. It's cheap, cheap grace. We're all Europeans now. Yes, we are. But we've got to face the shadows and the sufferings and the memories of division and hurt if we are to retrieve them as potential memories for the future. So that it's in that sense that the fifth province remains, I hope, a myth as a bearer of possible worlds. So I'll end with that. Thank you for your attention. Richard, thank you very much. You've given us a number of, of uh, keynotes. Uh, we'll not get to all of them, but I do hope we can go back to myth. I know that many of our contributors will want to pick up on linguistic hospitality. Uh, so we'll hold you there. And let me now uh, turn the spotlight to Michael Cronin. Michael, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Eve, for the, the, the invitation to take part uh, in the, the seminar today. And um, thank you. Richard, for always uh, a, a, an inspiring 
uh, introduction to so many different areas. So, you know, I, I'm just going to, to, to respond really to, to a, a number uh, of these points. And then I, I presume we can uh, speak more widely about them uh, afterwards. And I, I want to sort of begin to some extent with an, another origin story, not the origin story of, of, of the crane bag, but the, the origin story of, of Graf and why we set it up. In, in, in the mid uh, 1980s. Um, I mean, one of the things at the time uh, was a, a feeling of, and not only was the country sort of economically depressed, um, but it was also kind of psychically depressed and repressed um, because we had two very powerful cultures um, that were really smothering uh, Irish public life. Uh, one was the kind of center right uh, orthodoxy of the two. Uh, large parties. Um, and then there was the Workers' Party uh, on, on the left, um, created a, a particular culture of censorship uh, in, in RT uh, and the newspapers. So it was very difficult for all kinds of voices to make themselves uh, heard. But one of the things that I, I, I know that we were very keen on, on doing at the time when it was set up in, in 86 um, was trying to move away from a vision of Europe that was purely extractivist um, and opportunistic. Uh, in other words, that what Europe was primarily uh, was um, a source of, of, of grand aid and economic opportunity, which of course, you know, they're, they're, they're perfectly respectable motives. Um, but I suppose our concern was that um, we expected all this traffic to be one way, um, that, you know, all of this largesse would come in one direction. Uh, and that our re response to this um, would be an extraordinary lack of curiosity uh, in the cultures uh, of, of Europe uh, it, it's, itself. Um, so to try and uh, develop some sense of that cultural citizenship that uh, Ricoeur is, was, is thinking about. Um, and to do that through uh, engagement um, with, uh, particularly with uh, European writers from uh, different uh, languages both uh, east and 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 west, um, but I think one of the things that was very much to the uh, the fore as well in thinking about this um, was the sense in which that even when Irish um, identity or the notion of Irish identities got pluralized, it tends to be very much in a diasporic uh, anglophone and uh, anglocentric way. Uh, in other words, we're quite happy to light the candle uh, for. The Vargans in Canada, New Zealand, Australia, etc. You know, the, the, the countries were promptly part of the Anglo sphere. Um, but with the sole really exception of the Irish in Europe project, driven by historians uh, in, uh, in Maynooth, um, there was a, a, an extraordinary lack of curiosity about um, the Irish presence in the, uh, the non uh, Anglophone uh, world. Um, and that was one of the reasons, you know, with a number of people getting involved in, in setting up Literature Ireland, which is this body to, 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 to encourage the translation of, of literature, uh, Irish literature into other languages, but also reciprocally uh, to investigate the possibilities uh, of translating other literatures into Irish and English uh, in Ireland. Um, but part of that was really to try and counter something, a tendency that became even more marked when we moved into the 1990s. Um, you know, when uh, uh, Mary Harney said that Ireland was closer to Boston than uh, Berlin, uh, she didn't realize, of course, that a, um, a major European scholar would take up residence in Boston. But I think Mary wasn't thinking about you, Richard, when she made the statement. Um, but I think that that was um, very much uh, symptomatic of a, of a thing at the time in that immediate kind of pre-austerity uh, period uh, where all the, the eggs went into the Anglophone uh, basket um, and there was an extraordinary lack uh, of, of linguistic uh, hospitality, which is why I think to some extent in, in the kind of the, the, the post-austerity uh, uh, period, we, we are in a more interesting space, if you like, uh, in terms of um, opening up the society uh, to those European contacts. I mean, we've had the first language policy in the history of the state uh, with the Languages Connect policy uh, in 2017. Uh, at, at second level, we've had the restoration in, in, a, in a form of the uh, Foreign Languages uh, for Primary Schools uh, initiative. Um, if you look at the performance of the Irish state in the area of, of modern languages compared to what's happening in Britain, where modern languages are in free fall, um, we are in a kind of, in a, in a good 
an interesting uh, place. But I think what I do worry about is what I would call the gap between um, elite Europeanism, Europeanism and vernacular Europeanism. Uh, in other words, um, that you can see it with, with the kinds of cohorts that people that we get who study uh, modern languages at, at a third level tend to be recruited from particular kind of social classes, uh, backgrounds and so on of the opportunity for foreign travel. Um, but it's, it's, it's how, if you like, a sense of European cultural belongingness uh, will be uh, diffused throughout uh, the, the the society. How, how are we going to create, if you like, some sense of uh, a kind of vernacular uh, European identity? That I think is 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 quite the uh, the challenge. And I think in in respect of this uh, challenge, there is something else that I think we need to bear in mind as an important context to our discussions, um, which is that um, if you look at the notion of Europe and Europeanism, um, it has been subject to uh, a fairly sustained um, and often extremely persuasive uh, critique uh, on the part of, of post-colonial and race uh, scholars um, who have pointed to all kinds of toxic uh, European uh, legacies that have been professed, if you like, in the name of uh, some sense of kind of European superiority and, and, and so on. And I think this is why, in a sense, um, the notion of the um, of islands and islandness you know, that, 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 that Richard mentioned there, I think is a, a incredibly interesting. Um, but I think it's, it's to some extent, it's, it's got to be repurposed <laughs> for our, our, our new sensibilities around particular issues. Um, in other words, I'm, I'm particularly interested uh, in what we uh, in Ireland, in terms of colonial and post-colonial experiences, um, I've got to uh, learn uh, from Caribbean uh, scholars. I mean, one of the things that I find when reading Césaire and Glissant and so on is, and, and their sense uh, of trying to develop a form of uh, archipelagic thinking, um, that that is extraordinarily productive, I think, in terms of how we as uh, an island uh, nation uh, engage with other uh, islands, not just the island that's beside us, uh, but islands elsewhere in Europe, or indeed, I think, countries that have been islanded in, in various ways as a result uh, of experiences of uh, brutality, uh, oppression, and, and, and so on. So I think there's something uh, in, in there that really is, um, I, I, is important. And I, I probably finish on, on this point, is um, the notion of, I mean, Richard mentioned this, um, the idea of, of joint uh, sovereignty. Uh, and I think that very often sovereignty has been seen um, very much in kind of terrestrial uh, terms, you know, what we have, uh, we hold. Um, but I often think of, you know, um, maritime sovereignty, um, atmospheric uh, sovereignty, climate sovereignty, uh, which is basically the notion that you try and bring about the conditions uh, to uh, allow for the continued uh, well-being of the climate, uh, the atmosphere, the seas, and so on. And all of those, of course, um, are collective forms of sovereignty. The notion of an ecological sovereignty uh, as a kind of a unique, singular sovereign project is a, is a nonsense. You know, it, it doesn't make, it, it's by definition collaborationist and, and, and collective. And when I think of, you know, who was the first Irishman um, to say, we Europeans? It was Columbanus. Uh, what is Columbanus closely associated with? He's associated with tradition of natural theology, uh, the notion um, that the divine is manifested uh, in the natural world this is one of the kind of, if you like, the signature tunes um, of uh, in so many uh, Irish ha hagiographical accounts is that particular relationship uh, with the uh, the natural world. But it's a, it's if you like, it's kind of it's a transversal ontology. It's 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 not vertical. It's it's horizontal. Um, so I think that that kind of um, the development of that transversal uh, on, on ontology um, politically uh, can be done through a, a notion uh, of uh, ecological sovereignty that would see itself as archipelagic and would draw on those particular forms uh, of uh, Irish engagement uh, with uh, European thought and, and, and beyond. But I, I, I'll stop there and uh, I very much look forward to the debate afterwards. <laughs>
Michael, thank you. And you've raised obviously a very important ecological, um, not even a sub narrative, but the narrative that, that impinges on all these questions at the moment. I, I know people will want to come back to that. Can I remind everyone listening, please do, if you have questions already, start to submit them in the Q&A box and we'll get to those uh, very soon. But I'm now uh, very pleased to ask Ida Sagara to join us and Ida in her wonderful memoir, um, recollects what she describes as the euphoria of the time that Ireland did join the EU. But Ida, of course, you also have a the darker hinterland to that, those post-war years when you were meeting um, a different version of Europe in, in the refugees who had their own journeys to complete across the European landmass uh, after the unsettlements of the war. And uh, I'm, I'm really keen to hear your particular take on these questions. So I'll hand over to you now. Uh, thank you very much and um, thank you for inviting me and thank Richard for his very, and indeed Michael for their very thoughtful reflections. I'm going to talk about the, uh, my memories of the times up to 1973, because um, I was born in that nasty year for Europe, 1933. And um, I remember the grown-ups when I was just six, because I got blood poisoning that day. Um, the grown-ups not taking uh, my sorrows seriously because they were talking about a war in Europe, the 3rd of September, 1939. What was war? I mean, children relate everything to their own little world. And for me, war over the next years was when I had to eat some nasty dinner and my mother said, you sit there and eat it until it's all gone because poor little pony children would love to be having what you have. And... Uh, then there were the end of sessions in the 1940s, where we went up to, I'm by the, by the way, um, half to Rome and half Cork and Hiberno Catalan by marriage. We used to have to go up to my, we used to go up to my grandfather's in Oma. And it was like going into another world. We got practically stripped by some of the customs at the, at, uh, at the border going up to the north of Ireland. And then when we got there, we had to sit quiet in my grandfather's sitting room while he listened to a crackling radio of what was happening in faraway Europe. Um, and then there was the announcement on my 12th birthday, the 15th of August, 1945, that the Japanese had sur surrendered. And what did that actually mean? England, in fact, for Irish people, then and right into my uh, adult years, together with the United States, were the horizons of our world. So many of my generation, including my sister and myself, immigrated, not to America, as our uh, grand, grand uncles and aunts had done, but to England, who gave us, let it be said, um, a way of earning a living at a time our country could not or would not give us that and we should never I think forget it's due to them of course but for the first 50 years of our state statehood England as we call Britain was our main horizon and we left our parents in our case and in many other cases we left our parents who had educated us uh, to face old age alone some of us were lucky for reasons we come back to now the 1970s in contrast was such a memorable decade for Ireland, and if not evident at the time, an absolutely vital decade for Irish women. Um, the 1970s changed our perception of Europe. As a graduate student in Germany over many years, I had witnessed Conrad Adenauer's shrewd maneuvering to bring the new Western Germany back to, as part of Europe, culminating in the treaties of Rome in 1957. Um, the leaders, the leaders of Western Europe were all very old men. And there was a wonderful photograph in 1963 when de Gaulle and uh, Adenauer met in the palace, the Elysee Palace uh, in uh, Paris to sign the so-called Elysee Treaties. And they didn't, uh, they didn't show on the great photograph, they didn't show them the old men's faces. It just shows their boots. And those boots were very firmly um, uh, placed on the ground of the very splendid Elysee carpet, which is not suitable for, for, uh, for booted men. 
what a, uh, when, what a relief then it was in the 1970s. I was living in Manchester to come back home as I did every couple of months um, to meet at the contrast with the dreary outlook and endless strikes in England with the optimism of the Irish people. Now, I don't think the Irish people had a great deal to be optimistic about in the 1970s, uh, but, we, but we were traveling more, and especially to what we called the continent. With the prospect of membership of the EC, euphoria for Europe literally seized the popular imagination. And what people said to me in shops or bus stops, because everybody talks in Ireland, unlike in England, and my friends, what they were all saying to me proved an apt indicator of the voting passions when eventually we did uh, vote 83% to join Europe in the 1973 referendum. Uh, it's important to remember that Ireland couldn't have joined if Britain hadn't, uh, thanks to Edward Heath. But our growing enthusiasm for Europe in the years that followed was undoubtedly fueled by the sense that we are part of Europe now, and at last we can bypass England. That mood, uh, which continued in the 1970s, was a principal factor in our decision that I should apply for the vacant chair at Trinity College, although I was a UCD graduate, in 1975, and it was one of the best decisions of my life. I could just before we before I hand back, uh, because the general discussion would be most in, if I could comment on what Michael has said about uh, the various levels of Europeanness, and I don't think uh, the either the foreign uh, the Irish Foreign Office or indeed university people take half as much into account as they should of the tremendous numbers of contacts at uh, all sorts of level, chambers of commerce, um, uh, uh, au pairs coming, making contact, inviting their hosts to visit them in France and Germany and Italy and Greece, Greece and so on. And also the opportunities that the European Union has given uh, all sorts of people in kind of what we would call minor roles, people who are apprentices in one shape or another, or um, the foot football teams, sports people. The bonds between Ireland and Europe actually uh, from 1970, the 1970s are a lot, lot more diverse and it would be interesting to have a look at them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ida. And uh, of course, we, it's on our minds, the idea of Europe as a means of, in your own words, bypassing England. Um, I, I'm going to come on to Aidan O'Malley and Aidan in a recent brilliant essay, I think, on, on Ireland's relationship with Europe uh, in the uh, middle decades of the 20th century, you've, by contrast, talked about the fact that the Anglo-Irish connection is always implicit in the way that Ireland engaged with Europe. So we, we've got a tension here, haven't we? Um, I'm going to hand over to you now to, to, to uh, be the final speaker of our uh, respondents. So, Aidan. Thank you very much, Eve, and uh, thank you to Richard, Michael, and Ida as well uh, for great uh, contributions and for turning up. Um, uh, this has been a, a real pleasure to uh, participate in, in, in this. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to disappoint Eve somewhat um, if you expect me to talk about um, the perspective from here. Um, I, uh, when I was thinking what I might add to the contribution to the, the conversation today, I thought I would, as Richard was going to be here, and Richard was my external PhD supervisor, um, I thought I'd, I'd retrace my own um, career a little bit. Um, and because I think it talks to notions of the fifth province, to translation, to field day, and how that might tie up to notions of Europe. Um, I thought that that's, you know, when I was sketching out a few notes yesterday, I thought that that's the route I'll go. Um, but, but we can talk about the view from, um, the now semi-finalist in, um, in in the World Cup, um, and how Europe looks from from here uh, in in the general conversation. So, when I was doing a, a master's in European studies, I having already had a uh, first degree from Trinity in uh, pure English, I was looking at a way of combining the two in some respects, and I was interested in notions of European cultural identities. And uh, that's why I ended up in the doing PhD in the European University Institute in Florence, um, because I was thinking of how to think together the literature and the political and the ways in which we imagine ourselves to, to be and uh, how this finds or molds political expression. 
And translation seemed to me to talk precisely to this dynamic. Um, it's, you know, it, it also speaks exactly precisely to the experience of living in Europe in a multilingual um, context. And it's a process, of course, that has to be gone through. It's a, it's, 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 it, in order to encounter the other, it's, it's, it's not easy. It's a task, as uh, Walter Benjamin had it. And it also describes a, it's a process that, that, that describes cultural hierarchies as, at the same time, um, even as it seeks to negotiate or find a way of flattening these. Now, Richard mentioned an essay by Paul Ricoeur, and in fact, that, that very essay, um, Reflections on a New Ethos for Europe, was, I, I would say, precisely the starting point of my PhD work. Um, uh, uh, it's, a sh it's a short essay in a book that Richard um, edited, uh, Paul Ricoeur, the Her Hermeneutics of Action. And I was particularly attracted to this notion of translation as a form of, as a form of linguistic hospitality and how this becomes a possible ethical model for thinking about European identity. Um, I immediately felt that the model had to be taught again, as Richard has mentioned, in terms of Derrida's work on Benveniste and the relationship between hospitality and hostility. Um, because the, the history of translation shows us that it's not necessarily always an irenic act. Um, it can also elide and obliterate cultural difference. And where I saw this was in another sort of key starting point for my uh, research work, which was in Michael's book, book, book uh, Translating Ireland, um, which is rooted in actual um, translation practice. It's a critical survey that uh, unveils a history of translation, in which we can see acts of hospitality and hostility and how they are entirely ent you know, entwined. Michael's work also has sort of informed my sort of narrowing of uh, focus from Europe to Ireland, um, and to, because I thought that the dynamics that were in place in Ireland, um, the reasons for and the implications of the language shift, spoke in many respects to a much larger European context in, uh, in which languages are in constant and uh, not always smooth contact. Friel's jumping ahead, Friel's play translations in turn brought me to Field Day. And when I looked at the rest of its output, I realized that ID, the idea and act of translation was at the heart of its activities. Many of the company's plays were translations. Others, such as Friel's Making History, Kilroy's Double Cross, Terry Eagleton's St. Oscar, the, the, these were fundamentally concerned with how texts, ideas, people translate themselves or are translated across time and space. And these migrations can be thought of in terms of notions of fidelity and betrayal, which you know, as tra translation itself uh, tells us are fundamentally complicated uh, and never straightforward. Indeed, Dean's general introduction, which I'm going to get back to, um, also hangs on the idea of translation um, as a, a key to Irish lit literary and cultural experience. So in short, Field Day's work in Field Day's work, we can see translation speaks to acts of hostility because it describes Ireland's cultural history of, uh, and one of the key cultural legacies of this is the language shift. At the same time, Field Day's work looks towards an always problematic hospitality, um, a hospitable future on the island, as it performs the difficult um, processes that are required to come to terms with, uh, with, the, with other identities. After all, Field Day was intended to be a cultural intervention into the troubles. So jumping from this sort of field day sort of perspective, I want to think about how, well, not really jumping, but actually thinking about them together, this and the notion of Europe, because uh, this was a starting point. I started with Europe, I came to field day, and now to an extent what I'm doing is going back the other way and thinking uh, out again towards Europe. And I want to finish with a couple of sort of related points um, that might sort of you know, bring these two into conversation. And both these uh, points, which are very much interrelated, can be phrased in terms of, I think, Field Day's interpretation of the fifth province and the ways in which it thinks of the cultural and the political, a dynamic that also, I, I would argue, lies at the heart of Ireland's engagement with Europe. Um, because in the first place, there was clearly a fissure in Field Day's ranks itself about the priority given to the cultural. Friel, in his 1980 interview with uh, Fintan O'Toole, um, spoke of the necessity of the cultural state preceding and laying the groundwork for a political solution. Um, as he made clear in that interview, the fifth province informed his way of ordering these. He, he, he was inspired by Richard's work. 
James Dean, on the other hand, um, was inherently suspicious of the cultural uh, of, of cultural solutions that sort of allied it, uh, political realities, and this is at the heart of his polemical um, reading of translation in the general introduction to the Field Day anthology, which read the history of translation, particularly by Anglo that transmitted Irish vitality into English. This cultural process, he argued, um, became central to Irish nationalism, uh, with the result that it gave, and I'm going to quote him here, culture precedence over politics in the belief that the civilizing and ecumenical spirit of the first which softened the harsh sectarian real reality of the second. Now, while it may involve something of a stretch, this leads me to my second point, because um, you know, as Richard, uh, I think, has said, the the fifth province, in invoking this, this notion, Richard looked to excavate an Irish past in order to bring Irish experience into a broader European context. And as we've seen, the, the elaborations uh, um, that you spoke about, the post-national Ireland, the Europe of regions, these were ways of, as, as I've always seen it, and I think you were showing, saying today, Richard, ways of thinking of a possible political expression that the fifth province might actually um, get to. And so in light of the, the fact that the fifth province was a clear inspiration for Field Day and it had this kind of European background, what is it noticeable about Field Day is, a, is its lack of interest in contemporary um, European um, culture and politics. Now offhand, and I was thinking about this, and I, perhaps, perhaps I'm wrong, but I cannot think of any mention of the European Union or the EEC as it was then in, the, in Field Day's output at all. Um, the Europe that is there is that of the classics. It's uh, Sophocles, Chekhov, Moulier. Um, and perhaps where contemporary European culture finds expression in, uh, in field days is, is, is possibly in Heaney's uh, The Cure of Troy in that choral ode, uh, making history, uh, hope and history rhyme. Um, because that, as he's, his, as he's admitted himself, was inspired by the fall of the Berlin Wall and the excitement generated by that. And, I'd also suggest that it's informed by his reading of Eastern European poetry, um, with its, and I quote, quote the man himself, um, always good to quote Heaney, I find. Uh, unabashed, he talked about this poetry having its unabashed abstract nouns and conceptually aerated adjectives that delivered big, pulpish, worthy affirmations, which is how he put it in the, his essay, The Impact of Translation. And perhaps, and this is where I'm stretching, as I suspect, um, hopefully to some useful purpose, this, um, this reflects not just a blind spot in field day, but a problem with the way in which Europe has had been, and perhaps still is, we can discuss it, uh, discussed in Ireland. Um, since the time of Ophelan and the Bell, uh, Europe has regularly been employed in Irish political discourse and cultural discourse to an extent as well, um, as a sort of a, a site of inevitable modernization. This was the a vision of modernization that uh, where the economic and the political are never quite entirely defined, but are sort of enveloped in what was often seen to be a more sophisticated culture and indeed style. Um, and as a result, it was very much, um, as I think Michael was gesturing to earlier, a sort of a middle class discourse. Um, it's, and until recently, this Europe was cast as an aspiration for an always belated Ireland, something the country might acquire through processes that blended political notions with concepts of maturity that was often put in simply as Ireland should just grow up and become um, more, more European, a, a very, very problematic notion. Now, as when I was thinking about this then today, I was uh, I then recall this book, which came out recently, it's Seamus Weller's um, Critical History of, uh, of the Idea of, of Europe, which is, when I was reading that earlier this year, um, it also shows that, in fact, the idea of Europe has always been problematic, um, if we, including in the core Western European um, sort of heartland of the, the, the idea of Europe, particularly with the French and French and German thinkers. Um, it's a concept that these, the thinkers have thought to articulate in terms of notions of Christianity, in terms of civilization, which is often elite, or as a sort of a spirit in order to sort of articulate what might bring together a, a cosmopolitan idea um, that might oppose a nationalist idea. And all of these have depended on, as Weller well illustrates, a sort of a creation of others, be it Islam, be it uh, Russia, 
Turkey, um, the USA uh, was, a big, was a big one, and occasionally uh, Britain, um, and as Wells, um, Weller, excuse me, uh, notes, quoting uh, Benjamin's um, idea that every, every document of a civilization is also a document of barbarity. You know, the, the idea of Europe has created much misery uh, around the globe, and has indeed Michael was suggesting this kind of the, you, 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 beyond the, the, that's why it's been subjected to post-colonial critique. Um, and I think we, we can never quite for, forget that. Um, now, one of the things about Weller's book as well is that Ireland really is, is not mentioned. It's just a, doesn't feature in this kind of collection of thinkers about Europe. And uh, there's possibly a, that's possibly a positive thing um, that, you know, that Irish thinkers on the periphery of Europe um, have been rather cautious about making large um, pronouncements about what it is to, to be Europe, considering that the history of that, that idea. Um, you know, I, I think the only people who have made those rather large statements about uh, in the 20th century, possibly being the Catholic Church, really, about what it is to, to be European and this kind of notion of Christendom. Um, at that and perhaps Finnegan's Wake. Um, but at the same time, I think that lack of critical engagement with the idea of Europe has also had a, a problem in that it has left that sense of Europe as being that sort of semi-mystical, sort of always to come sort of notion. And, and perhaps that's what I'm trying to sort of investigate and look at in um, this project of thinking about uh, various different ways in which Europe has been articulated uh, in, in Irish literature and um, cultural debate. And I think I'll leave it at that and we'll open it up. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Aidan. I'm going to ask uh, Robert, who's uh, managing our tech, to put us back in uh, gallery view. Um, and we've got some time for discussion. There are some questions coming in. Um, what I might kick off, though, by, by gathering some of the ideas that have come through um, uh, from all of the papers and take these back to you, Richard. One of the things that we started with, obviously, in, in your approach was really looking to Europe as a place of cultural resolution and almost a, a, a mythical resolution, a place of sanctuary because of Ireland's difficulties, a place that in a way uh, provided a form of reconciliation in its existence. But what everybody really has raised is that that leaves something out. I wonder what you, you, you would say about the idea that sometimes Ireland has been guilty of a kind of pick and mix approach to, to Europe and European culture. Um, following on, perhaps, from, from what Michael talked about, you know, we've taken the elite, but not the vernacular. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I think it's absolutely right <laughs> and correct to, to as a reminder to us, because in our effort, effort as um, Edith said, to sort of bypass England, we have uh, very often invoked uh, Europe as this um, almost utopian, um, aspirational place uh, beyond the Isles to the east that will um that will bring that will bring a solution to all our problems so I, I think in all three responses I noted sort of a very healthy um balancing or counterbalancing of a hermeneutics of aspiration about Europe um including that wonderful piece by recur that you know this could be the basis of a linguistic hospitality could be the basis of a of of, of a new politics um but uh, we need, uh, on the other hand, this hermeneutics of suspicion uh, mm. regarding the crimes of Europe and, and not just within Europe, but beyond Europe. So I, I very much take that on board. And, and liked um, what uh, Michael was saying at the beginning about the ar archipelagic thinking that extends not just um, eastwards, but westwards and takes in the the Caribbean islands and all that we can learn from other cultures that are not sort of confined to the British Irish, but but uh, sort of come back to, to haunt us and to invite us to other ways of thinking because the Irish were part of the British colonial um, campaign uh, throughout the world also. I mean, look at the number of Irish in in the in the army and and uh, the militia in India, for example. So, um, and most of the people with Irish descent in the Caribbean islands, and, and of mixed race, who are called Murphys and O'Donnells and whatnot, came with the British, um, not with Saint Brendan. So I think that's very important to remember. And also the 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 importance of de -territ 
the deterritorializing territorializing of sovereignty. I think that's really important. Um, in in a way, what you what Michael says there at the end about at the end of his remarks about an ecological sovereignty, I'm all for, and sovereignty in that sense as an integrity, um, when it is transversal and not hierarchical. But mm -hmm. I think we have to operate quite a bit of again critical suspicion about the term, given the fact that politically, as Kantorovich and others have pointed out, King's New Body, it comes from the Platonic metaphysical notion of the sun, which is a center and which centralizes. It's logocentric. And then that is delegated down to the emperor. We go from Plato's Agathon, you know, the idea of the one to the emperor, the Holy Roman Emperor, and then to the king. And the king has two bodies, the literal and the symbolic, and the, you know, the king is dead, long live the king. And then with popular sovereignty becomes linked with the people, but also with land. And the more it's territorialized and desymbolized and demythicized, the more dangerous in some respects it becomes. Not that the king and the emperor didn't do awful things, but the, the unity was, was confined in a way to them. And if they died, they were placed by, some, by somebody else. But when, the, when it latches onto land, it becomes extremely dangerous in terms of nationalist, exclusivist yeah. sovereignty. Okay. And that, yeah. that is a recipe for war, as Hannah Rent says. Mm -hmm. So I think, I mean, I really like the idea of ecological sovereignty because politically speaking, it's a contradiction in terms. It, it, it's taking a notion of unitary power and it's saying it's everywhere. You know, it's taking the center and making it a circumference. So I, I, I really like that sort of paradox contained in the term um uh, yeah. ecological sovereignty so maybe i'll just stop there and allow other questions in because thank you richard and i'm going to bring uh, michael back in in a minute i'm really interested in how these two terms territory and sovereignty are both emerging from this discussion uh, already but but briefly to Ida, because this idea of of you know did we have ideas of europe that perhaps haven't been fulfilled i mean you've You've lived through the period of, of Irish accession before and afterwards, and you mentioned that feeling of euphoria and enthusiasm and, and uh, passion in a way that the Irish had once Europe was there as not only a means of bypassing England, but a means of fulfilling a kind of uh, identity destiny, I suppose. Do you think that in the years that followed accession, Europe lived up to those hopes? In the sense as long as things went well for us economically, they did, but even though they didn't, Europe provided. I mean, the amount of the emigration to Germany in the appalling 80s, where, but I'd like to uh, uh, just touch on two things, which one of which hasn't come up. Europe has been very good for, uh, for women, and mm. uh, it forced our own governments uh, very reluctantly for financial reasons to do all sorts of things they didn't want to do in the late 70s. But also, I think the Green Movement in Ireland has been tremendously promoted and helped by um, in political parties, the successful political parties, uh, especially in Central Europe. And a final point, which you haven't asked me about, but we have to, I think, remember that our notions of Europe are very limited by the languages we do know, which tend to be more Western European languages. And now I know Scandinavian functions in the Irish imagination is a good thing in 1066 and all of that. But we ought to remember that the center of Europe, if as I hope we continue to do, we regard Russia in Europe as part of Europe, that the center of Europe lies far, far to the east yeah. of what was once known as the Iron Curtain. I think it's somewhere in Latvia, if I'm not wrong. Yes, and and Ada, you, you lead me beautifully to a question that's come in uh, from Ellie Payne, because I'm, I've got that wing of Europe uh, in my mind uh, with Ellie Payne's question, which I might throw over to, to you, Aidan, initially, or to Michael. How have other European nations reconciled their nationalism with Europeanness? To what extent is the Irish experience uh, exceptional? Um, now, I'm not sure what the answer to that might be, but, but Aidan, I mean, you're living in Croatia, which has a very peculiar history and a very particular relationship to uh, European identity and a very particular history of its own nationalism with the church um, mm -hmm. uh, to one side. Could you could you tackle that one? 
Well, it brings to mind, um, first off, a, uh, something that uh, Joe Lee, the historian, once said to me um, and many years ago when he was, we were talking about the notion of Irish historiography and how Irish historians are always saying that our Ireland needs to be much more comparative. And that he said, well, actually, the problem is that Ireland is too comparative, but it's only com it's inherently comparative, but it's only with Britain. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and the problem is Britain, because Britain is very unusual. It's, uh, so I think that whenever we talk about our Irish experience of nationalism, it always seems odd because it's it's inevitably seen in, beside Britain, which is very unusual in terms of its state, its history of statehood. Um, it, it, you go anywhere else in Europe, and suddenly Ireland Irish experience looks much more normal. Um, so you know, notions of nationalism, after all, come from Germany more as, as much as any, anywhere else. The German Romantics, uh, you, we're, we're all sort of living in their world as as well. So look, coming from Croatia, and indeed I see that um, uh, you know, th th there is a Croatian um, expert in the in the audience here as well. Uh, so I'm, I, 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 I'm not some, uh, I feel you know, some, somewhat uh, abashed about saying anything about uh, Croatia or anything too much. You, I, you see the a similar process, and this is what um, Hubert Butler was very good at. Um, he, when he came to, to, to Croatia, he recognized things. He, he, it wasn't because it was necessarily Catholic, it was just the way in which the estate was being run um, and, and the way in which a church was playing a role in, the, in, in that. And as he often said himself, it could have been an, another denomination. It, it had a similar form, um, nationalism took a similar form. Young, young, nations trying to find forms of identity reach towards that which is most available and there are then within the within all of these uh, cultures forces that will look to you know, profit from that um, and uh, the, so uh, i think i'll just leave it at that it's uh, i think again it, it is an issue of how we view ourselves co constantly within an anglophone context and within a context which is always in inevitably related to britain um, and exactly, exactly. and, and uh, I, you know i should note that several people joining us today uh, i'm noting lily zach is with us who's written brilliantly recently on the replications whether they're metaphoric or political, uh, across right across the European continent of those constitutional and national and nationalist formations and indeed unionist formations uh, that we've seen in Ireland over the past century. So this work is beginning to happen, I think. Um, I, I want to come. I want to come back to language in a way, um, and maybe bring you in, Michael, because Heather Ingman has asked a, a, a question leading on from. Christeva, who was mentioned by, by Richard, how useful is Christeva's idea of the necessity of recognizing the stranger within in order to reach out to the other? She seems to suggest that if we're too comfortable with our own national identity, we'll fail to engage with others. Um, when we're thinking about this idea of a linguistic hospitality from whatever angle you want to look at that, it's not straightforward, is it? And we're not living in a kind of uh, utopian, um, egalitarian place where all languages matter. Um, and there are strangers even within the linguistic formations and minority languages of Europe. Um, so I just wonder if you if you might want to tackle that and talk a bit more. Well, absolutely, because I think if you, if you look at, you know, um, I, I was talking earlier about you know, vernacular and elite forms of Europeanism, but it's also what we call you know, uh, elite uh, and vernacular forms of multilingualism, you know, like somebody who can speak, uh, who's fluent in French, German, Italian, uh, so people are just, you know, uh, gobsmacked. Um, somebody, you know, who's working in their local deli, uh, who speaks three, four languages, you know, um, uh, but those languages have, happen to be Arabic, Pashtun, uh, Farsi, uh, all, all this, this, this is not considered to be uh, something that's worth, and you know, so few of these languages um, mm -hmm. are taught in our institutions. And you know, when we look at at at, at Europe, I mean, look look at the city of, of Dublin. You know, twelve languages on the help board in 1961. Now there's 187. Um, you know, there was an idea that was knocking about the 60s and 70s that you know all cities would head towards a kind of form of linguistic homogenization uh, and it would be the kind of melting pot and uh, a particular kind of dominant language that emerged and everybody starts speaking that. In fact, if you look 
at the linguistic ethnography uh, of Europe and elsewhere, it's gone completely uh, in the, uh, the other direction. But there's a kind of time lag, I think, in, 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 in recognizing that. I think, it, we, um, so that is certainly uh, one way in which I think in policy terms and how we organize you know, our educational institutions, we have to rethink uh, these, these things. And some rethinking is going on with what we call legacy languages in, in, in the educational system. But I think the, in, the, to, to go back to Heather's question, I, it always strikes me in the Irish case, there's, there's, there's a very interesting kind of dynamic because, you know, we went through this quite spectacular uh, language shift in very recent historical history. So there's, there's a curious form of self-estrangement uh, from, uh, you know, the, the this, the person who's forever fretting in the shadow of another man's language. You know, this, this, there's a the kind of haunting uh, that goes on linguistically uh, in, in the society, which I think then means uh, that engagement with language and, and, and languages uh, always becomes a kind of a, 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 a troubled uh, thing. You know, you can see people's reactions to learning Irish and so on. I mean, uh, how, how difficult and troubled that, 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 that becomes. But it's, it's certainly not... a you know, uh, an easy place. It's more like the, the, the quaking sobs that they, they, they used to talk about. I think just in this respect, it may deviate slightly and, and pick up on, on um, uh, Richard's point there about, about sovereignty and the e ecological sovereignty and, 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 and bearing in mind what Ida said about uh, women in Europe. I, I often think to see, you know, flas in Irish is often used the word to kind of capture the notion of, 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 of sovereignty, uh, but it's often presented in kind of terrestrial terms, you know, it's the, it's the flaw, the leader who becomes betrothed to the land. There's a kind of that ritual of, of, of betrothed. Um, and this is often seen. Uh, and then, of course, if the ruler is unjust, uh, then the natural world reacts. And it, there's, you know, you, you find this in, in the various tales. Um, but if there's another equally kind of present and powerful way of thinking about sovereignty in the Irish tradition of what we might call self, which is fluvial sovereignty. And this is the, you know, the, the, the goddess Anya, for example, uh, with a Shannon, where it, it isn't this kind of centralizing um, kind of direction. It's a kind of metamorphic uh, force uh, where you know, the, the goddess endlessly metamorphizing into to other forms and in, involved in a kind of a coexistence, a contiguous relationship with these, the, these other forms. Um, so I think of the stories themselves and, and how, they, uh, how they think about uh, a notion of, 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 of influence um, can often go off in, in very, very different um, to, to, to directions. Thanks, Michael. And in fact, you've touched and, and addressed or answered, I think, another very good point that's being made in the uh, Q&A by Wendy Bracewell, who reminds us that much as we might look to the idea of translation as in itself a virtuous and, and welcome activity, it does have its own hierarchies. It does have its own politics, something that uh, you as experts in this field uh, are, uh, are, are more than aware of. Um, I've just got, I think we've time for, uh, there's a question that's come in from an anonymous attendee. Um, interested to hear the speaker's thoughts on the European Commission's expansionist plans in the Balkans. Um, but I think uh, the, the, the second part of that question is perhaps what we might look to. How, how is Ireland's role as an EU border and outpost going to play out in the battle for narrative and territory? Um, I'm pleased this question has come in because one of the things I wanted to get to before the end from all of you is we've, we've had a lot about what Ireland thinks about Europe and what Ireland looks to in Europe. What does Europe want from Ireland and what did Europe want from Ireland 50 years ago? Uh, I mean, how are we positioned if we reverse the line of sight? We have a couple of minutes maybe to touch on this, but Aidan, I might kick off with you and then... See if everybody can get a minute on that one. Um, it's a, it's it is an interesting question, and it's a, it's something that, in fact, I uh, raised last week with Lily Sacco. I know is it uh, is attending here um, because she was coming. She came over to Rieke to give a talk about um, Irish diplomatic links with um, Britain, with Austria, and the Czech. Um, Czechoslovakia and, uh, and Hungary in the first half of the 20th century. Um, and I, uh, I was struck by the fact that she was looking at the Irish view of, uh, uh, on, you know, uh, on, on these countries, on these small succession states. And one of the questions I asked her was, 
you know, would the would the next book not be the other way around? You know, did you have the language skills? And and that is one of the that is again one of the issues. You, you, any, any perspective that our Ireland has on, as uh, Ida was, was saying, is we, we are limited by our linguistics, uh, by our linguistic ab ability. Um, in terms of what Ireland offers, uh, you know, in the ten years or so I've been in Croatia, the vision of Ireland has changed dramatically um, because. Of, Croatia joined the European Union in the in the, in the meantime, and uh, there were hardly you know, Croatians did not know that much about Ireland. It had a certain mythic status that inevitably has. Um, now it is a major source of um, migration, and uh, Ireland plays a role in the mm -hmm. current political sort of discourse in Croatia. As that's it, it's a sort of a symbol of Croatian failing. The, the, it's the Ryanair flight that you now take to Ireland because you can't you can't get a job in in Croatia. So that's a very very different sort of status. So looking at it from from one periphery, it's again the echoes are very similar. You know, it's it's it sounds like Ireland sounded thirty years ago. You know, I'm now in in, in Croatia hearing you know, Ireland is playing the role that say Germany or Britain played in Irish discourses. Um, so that, I'll just offer that that, that, that limited perspective. Thanks, Aidan, and that curious reversal is noted. Mm -hmm. Ida, I don't know if you have anything brief to, to just add. Very, to this. Just very briefly, but it's more German than anything else. Um, Ireland offered the uh, land of the imagination, which Russia used to provide before the Cold War. And they still come to Ireland for, for this sort of thing. That's beautifully put, and I'm sure absolutely true. I have time, Michael, and then I'm going to finish with Richard. Michael, anything to you speak every language uh, from a, from the a perspective of outside looking in. How does Ireland look to Europe? Well, it's a fabulous collection of essays the Royal Irish Academy brought out there um, three or four years ago. Um, Ireland the European Eye, uh, the Megan Hofter uh, collection, and basically there's 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 two scenarios. Um, one is, is the pre-modern, it's kind of pre-modern pre playground um, where it's fun, uh, they speak English, um, but they're, you know, it's the house of hilarity. Um, they're, they're, uh, and then the, the other is the kind of, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fable of, of, of modernity. You know, this, this is what happens when you follow the script of modernization, you know, but it, it goes uh, a, a, a particular way. So I, I think that's, um, it, one of the, the, the greatest obstacles still um, is, you know, 87% um, of French secondary school students two years ago uh, couldn't actually locate uh, Ireland in European map. Um, <laughs> so I think sometimes we've got to be careful small island hubris. Um, but, uh, the ignorance uh, about uh, our uh, country for all its achievements <laughs> can often be sort of fathomless. So we, we, we need to be conscious of that as well. And thanks. And on that encouraging note, Richard, we began with, with regions and provinces uh, and myth. Um, <clears throat> if you were to address the question of how Ireland, you think, looks to Europe or has looked to Europe, is there anything you'd like to finish on? Well, just very briefly, and picking up on the question, what, what, what does it mean for Ireland to be an outpost nation on the periphery of Europe? I think, picking up on something said earlier about Boston and Berlin, that it, we need to have both and extend the, 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 the movement to Boston to take in the, 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 you know, the Caribbean islands and other nations westwards that we tend to ignore, and uh, to then extend Berlin's <laughs> frontier more eastwards to include, as Ida was saying, you know, Latvia, Vil Vilnius and Kiev. So um, that's just something I would say that we are sort of in the center and potentially moving out to the circumference in different ways. And we are an Anglophone country, mm -hmm. Michael just reminded us, of course, um, but we also speak a less used language within Europe. And that's very important and should create a sense of solidarity linguistically with other lesser used languages. So um, I, I'd just like to add one tiny word on Kristeva, who came up earlier. I think it's important. I earlier misattributed a phrase um, to Kristeva, which is actually Marina Warner's, that civilization be begins with the handshake. But I think the point made about Kristeva is really important. And Ireland may have a, a role here, as Freud says, when we were young and Freudent. And um, I think Irish literature and Irish culture has an ability to actually connect with the unconscious. And that's not just the Irish unconscious, uh, but the European unconscious. 
And um, when Chris David talks in Strangers to Ourselves about the necessity for each of us as, as persons, but also as nations, to interrogate and to accommodate the uh, and confront the stranger within ourselves so that we can then relate to the strangers outside of ourselves, she is talking about the uncanny. She, she's invoking Freud in that final chapter. And the uncanny has eros and it has thanatos. And I think that it's very important to encounter that stranger within ourselves as both a positive force and affirmation of eros, connection, communion, community, conversation, but also thanatos, the dark force of, of destruction and violence. And, um, you know, Joyce once said, or a character in Finnegan's Wake, Sukkawana lose me. And uh, maybe Ireland can actually help to Sukkana lose and psychoanalyze its own unconscious and, in a way, uh, Europe's unconscious in terms of how we relate to hospitality towards strangers. Thank you, Richard. That seems the, the, the most appropriate way of, of looking at the Irish-European relationship for the times we are in uh, for 2022, moving into 2023. Um, and uh, as always, look, this, we'll never get to the end of this. There's a lot more to be said, but I think some really useful ideas have come through, even in this short discussion. Uh, we didn't get to lots of questions, and I do notice somebody's asking, Hilary Lennon's asking about the role of European studies. Uh, I will note that the next seminar in this series, which we hope will be in person, is actually going to look at the function of Irish studies, particularly as it's uh, taught and uh, researched in Central and Eastern Europe. So we'll keep everybody posted um, about that. Uh, but we must draw to a close today with great regret because I thoroughly enjoyed this. I want to thank um, Aidan who helped set this up and all of the Trinity Long Room Hub team who've worked behind the scenes to keep the tech going. Um, I want to uh, thank our wonderful panelists and speakers today, Richard Carney, who is uh, most welcome to come anytime, Richard, and talk to us. <laughs> Um, Michael Cronin, Edith Segara, and again, Aidan O'Malley, thank you for your time and your thoughts. And let me thank everybody who's joined us online. I look forward to seeing you all again in the very near future. So we'll bring things to a close there. Thank you very much, everyone, and goodbye. Thank you, Eve. Bye-bye. Thank bye you bye. all. Thank you.